Hello everyone, my name is Matias and today we're going to be going over some concepts on how to approach MBE questions on the bar exam and then we're also going to be doing an MBE question uh, to apply some of these concepts. For those of you that feel like you need some work on essays or some substantive rules, you can check out our other free videos on our channel, give them a thumbs up if you like them and share with other friends that may need it and you can also subscribe uh, so that you can get notifications when we put out more free content. Uh, and if you need some more in-depth help, uh, you can check out our bar review and tutoring options on our website, all of which are going to be linked below in the description. So for MBE portion of the bar exam, uh, this usually accounts for 50% of the uniform bar exam score. So it's a very important and large part of the bar exam. To improve your MBE score, you really want to focus on three main components. You want to focus on the call of the question, you want to associate facts to rules, and you want to choose an answer in your mind before you start looking at the answer choices. So uh, first, let's go with the call of the question. Okay, so what does the call of the question tell you? Can we determine what subject is being tested from the call of the question? So a lot of the time you can, and although this doesn't apply all the time, you should use it when it does because it'll help you quickly identify what question, uh, what type of question it is that you're dealing with. So I'll give you a few examples. So for evidence questions, they'll generally say, uh, is the evidence admissible? That's how you know it's an evidence question. For Crim Pro, the question will say, should the evidence be suppressed? Uh, for con law, it'll just ask you, is it constitutional or not? Or is it a constitutional violation? Or does it violate uh, someone's constitutional rights? For civil procedure, a lot of times you'll get um, the call of the question will say, should the motion be granted or denied? Um, and you want to use this information when the call of the question does tell you what subject you're, you're dealing with to compartmentalize the rules that you have to think about as you start to read through the fact pattern of the question. Again, this doesn't happen every time, but when it does, it helps because now you've gone from the thousand rules that you have to know for the bar exam down to just the hundred or so that you need to know for that subject as you're going through the fact pattern. Second, for the call to question, you wanna think about who is the party that we need to analyze the question for. You don't wanna analyze the question beyond the scope of what is being asked and you don't want to analyze it as to the wrong person. Second, you want to start associating facts with rules. So you want to look for words that you associate with certain rules as you're reading the fact pattern in the, uh, in the, in the um, question, the MBE question. So for example, if you see something that refers to so-and-so as a citizen of this state or has lived their entire life in this state, usually they're getting at some jurisdictional issues, right? Whether it be subject matter or personal jurisdiction. Uh, if the fact pattern mentions that so-and-so said something and it was out of court and now they're in a trial, it's probably a hearsay question. Um, and then if you ever get anything like that says, is the person, was the person aware or was not aware? It, usually that can mean if you're dealing with a property question that it's talking about the notice components that can apply to uh, property law. And so you generally want to keep these things in mind because again, as you're going through the fact pattern, it'll help you further narrow down what the rule that you need to analyze is. Another quick note is anytime you see numbers doesn't happen very often on a MBE question or even on an M MEE question, you want to pay attention to those because they're not there by coincidence. Typically, if they give you numbers, they're there uh, for something important. Next, you want to formulate the answer in your mind before you look at the answer choices. And you wanna to start to be uh, notice patterns wherever you can. So this means that you're gonna rely on your reasoning and knowledge of the rule as opposed to what the answer choice says um, to arrive at the correct answer. The more that you do this, the more that you're going to reinforce your knowledge of the rules as opposed to just get good at guessing questions. So again, the key concepts are calls of the question, associating facts to rules that you know, and formulating an answer in your mind before you pick an answer choice. So altogether, this is CQFM, or also known as Call Queens Freddie Mercury.
For all those of you that do not get that uh, pop culture reference, you have some Googling to do after you are done with this uh, video and with the bar exam. So now let me share my screen here and let's go over a MBE question and apply these concepts that we just learned. Okay, here we are. So here we're going to first go through the call of the question, which was the first component that we discussed. So let's read here. Should the company's motion be granted? Well, we had just discussed that usually when you see a call of the question saying granting or denying a motion, you're probably looking at a civil procedure question. So let's just keep that in mind uh, as we go through. So let's see here. Let's highlight this. So motion granted. Okay, let's start reading. Woman was in a driving accident on a state highway while she was driving company's vehicle. A subsequent inspection of the vehicle yielded inadequate brake maintenance for which the company was solely responsible. Okay, so again, now associating facts with uh, rules, you know, solely responsible, um, maintenance, et cetera, this kind of sounds like a little bit of torts, right? But something that is jumping out at me is that they're essentially resolving any potential legal issue as to torts for us by telling us the company was solely responsible, right? So they're not really throwing it into controversy. So important to know, but doesn't seem like it's going to create an issue so far. So let's keep going. Woman sued company in federal district court under the Federal Torts Act for the injuries she suffered. Okay, so this becomes important. Anytime you see federal torts act, right, or, or federal anything in district court, federal district court, this should be triggering not only civil procedure, but also federal torts act being the claim that it's being brought under federal question under subject matter jurisdiction. But let's just keep that in mind for now. Uh, a woman seeks to also join a claim against company for breach of contract due to unpaid wages allegedly owed to woman by company. Okay, so now we have breach of contract. Okay, so she's got two claims, one for a tort and the other one for breach of contract. So that's important to keep in mind. Now we're seeing numbers, right? And as I mentioned before, you want to always take note of any numbers being given to you because they could become important. A uh, woman seeks 50,000 damages for the driving accident and 25, or pardon me, 26 for the unpaid wages. So these numbers are important. And knowing that this is probably going to be a civil procedure question, why are these two numbers important? Because if you add them together, 50 plus 26, you get 76, which overcomes the potential amount and controversy needed in a diversity action for subject matter rule. So let's just keep that in mind, because right now we don't know. Uh, what ultimately we the motion is being brought under. So let's see, woman has lived her entire life in state B. Okay, this is important, right? She lived her entire life in state B. It's important because this could become a personal jurisdiction or subject matter jurisdiction, uh, important fact to know. Company is incorporated in state A and has its corporate office uh, where all officers work in state B. So that's definitely important because now it looks like it's going to become a citizenship issue, right? Potentially diversity, especially since we're seeing already the amount of controversy part of the diversity jurisdiction rule. And now we're being given facts about the uh, citizenship, which is also the other component of diversity jurisdiction. Now, lastly, it says company has moved to dismiss both claims brought uh, by woman uh, on the basis that the court lacks subject matter jurisdiction. So now we know exactly what it is that we need to analyze for. Essentially, it's the subject matter jurisdiction doctrine, right? Which can only have three different uh, rules under it. It's diversity jurisdiction, federal question, or supplemental jurisdiction. Those are the only three ways in which a court can have um, subject matter jurisdiction. So now we pulled the important facts, we've associated them to the rule, and we're, we know we're down to essentially three rules that are applicable. So now we want to formulate the answer in our mind before we ever look at the answer choices, okay? So the question is, is the company's bringing a motion to dismiss both claims, right? And both, and the claims are, one of them is a tort action under the Federal Tort Act, and the other one is a breach of contract action. So when you get a question like this, you want to go one at a time through the claims. First claim, it's federal, uh, it's a Federal Torts Act claim. Well, 
out of our three rules that we know, one of them is federal question for subject matter jurisdiction, which requires that a controversy arise under a treaty, the constitution or federal law, and that it be part of a well-pled complaint. Well, here we know that the lawsuit is being brought under the Federal Torts Act. So that is very clearly federal law. So that meets the first component. The second component is, is a well-pled part of a complaint? Well, we know here that it's because of the injuries that she suffered, right? Which was an accident that occurred on a state highway while driving the company vehicle. So that definitely satisfies the um, well-pled complaint component. So now we know that the first claim for the tort action, the car accident, is well-pled under federal question. Therefore, the court is going to have federal question jurisdiction over the first claim. Now we move on to the second claim. The second claim is just breach of contract. That means that it is not a federal claim. Breach of contract is just state law, right? And so for state law, we have two options that uh, a claim can come in under subject matter rules. It's going to be either diversity jurisdiction or supplemental. So let's go through diversity first. Diversity jurisdiction requires first an amount in controversy be pled in good faith over 75,000, which here we have because she's claiming 50,000 in damages and uh, 26,000 for unpaid wages. It's brought by the same plaintiff and against the same defendant. So the claims can be aggregated to meet amount in controversy. So that aspect is met. Next, we need diversity of jurisdiction, which means that all plaintiffs must be diverse in citizenship from the defendants. So here we only have one plaintiff, one defendant. We know that Citizenship is established by domicile, which is the place where you live and have the intent to remain. Here we know that the woman lived her entire life in state B, which is good enough to satisfy domicile in state B, which is where the woman is a citizen of. But then we have the company, which is incorporated in state A and has its corporate office and uh, workers in state B. This becomes important because how it, where is a company a citizen of? They are a citizen of their place of incorporation and the place where they have their principal place of business, known as the nerve center, where the officers work, the corporate officers. Well, here we know that um, the company is incorporated in state A, so it's a citizen of state A, and has its corporate office in state B. Therefore, it's also a citizen of state B. So both of the plaintiff and the defendant are citizens of state B. Therefore, there's no diversity jurisdiction. So we got to toss that out. That leaves us only with supplemental. For supplemental jurisdiction, you have essentially uh, two requirements. The first one is the court has to already have subject matter jurisdiction over a claim between the parties, which here we know that the court has federal question jurisdiction under the Federal Torts Act brought by the woman against the company, so that is met. And then second, it has to arise out of the same um, case in controversy, right? Which is, they must share a common nucleus of operative fact, the two claims. Well, the first claim is over a car accident that came because of inadequate brake maintenance by the company. The other one is just unpaid wages. And even though it's the same defendant, they don't really have anything to do with each other. They certainly don't have a common nucleus of operative fact, right? One of them is the brakes didn't work. The other one is the woman was not paid what she was supposed to be paid. And so supplemental jurisdiction will also fail. So now we have the answer to both of our questions, right? Uh, to answer the question of whether the company's motion should be, grant, should be granted, which is first the federal question, um, the federal question on the Federal Torts Act, it should not be granted because the court does have subject matter jurisdiction under federal question. But the second breach of contract claim, the motion should be granted to the party because it is uh, unrelated and there's no diversity in jurisdiction. So diversity jurisdiction will fail because of lack of diversity in citizenship and, and supplemental will fail because they don't share a common, the two claims do not share a common nucleus of operating fact. So now we already know the answer. Now let's go look for an answer choice that reflects our reasoning. So answer choice A, yes, as to both claims between because the parties are not diverse in citizenship. Well, it's correct that they're not diverse in citizenship. We established that because they're both citizens of state B, but it's incorrect as to um, it being the motion being granted as to both claims, right? Because we already established that the court has federal question jurisdiction over the tort action, the tort claim. So A is wrong. 
No, as to either claim, because the woman's claims arise under a question of federal law. Well, that's correct for the first claim, which is brought under the Federal Torts Act, but it's incorrect as to the breach of contract, which is just a run-of-the-mill state law claim. So answer choice B is incorrect. The second one is no, should the company's motion be granted, no as to the breach of contract claim because the parties are diverse in citizenship. So again, notice how this wrong answer choice is misstating a, uh, a rule. They are not diverse in citizenship because they both are citizens of state B, as we noticed up here. Lastly, yes, as to the breach of contract claim, only because it is unrelated to the claim uh, for which the court does, not, does have subject matter jurisdiction. And you can see how this is correct because it follows the reasoning that we made, which was, Yes, the court has federal question jurisdiction over the tort claim, but no, it does not have jurisdiction under diversity or supplemental um, for the uh, breach of contract claim. So again, our reasoning is we're only looking for an answer choice that is going to reflect our reasoning. So again, the key concepts are you want to focus on the call of the question, you want to associate facts to rules that you know, and you want to formulate the answer in your mind before you go pick uh, an answer choice. So again, it's CQFM, call Queens Freddie Mercury. So keep those three things in mind. And if you found our video helpful, give it a thumbs up, share it with your fellow bar takers and subscribe to our free content so you get notifications when we put out more videos and check out our website if you feel like you need any tutoring or bar review. Thank you all and the best of luck on the bar exam.